Okay, good evening everybody. Uh, nice to see you coming here at this time. <laughs> this is a bit hapokas <laughs> schedule for today's presentation, but let's not that come in our, into our way. So, um, today's topic is leather armor and uh, a few disclaimers. So this presentation covers leather as the primary structural material in uh, armor, as opposed to uh, auxiliary parts like uh, soft leather strappings and so on. And uh, I published a book this year, or made a book this year on the same topic. Um, and the contents of this presentation is based on, on that book. And uh, if you wish to download a pre um, today's presentation, a slightly altered version of what I'm going to show today, uh, hopefully that QR code works. Can somebody confirm? Nice. Yeah. So on the contents uh, today, so some introduction to the topic. Then, because leather armoring is not or even mostly about hardening the material like the title of the book says, it's a lot more. So I'm going to cover fundamentals of leather working in armoring, uh, then hardening methods, uh, performance of hide-based materials. So today uh, we are talking about leather, partially tanned leather and rawhide. And uh, then some historical uh, leather armor recipes and uh, historical constructions from extant pieces. And finally, a summary. I have absolutely no idea how long this presentation would naturally take. So let's see where we reach by the end of this session. I kind of don't like having monologues, so I, I wish to be interrupted. If you have any qu questions, comments, and so forth, uh, you can ask the questions in English or in Finnish, if you will. OK, uh, something about me. I made up. Uh, quite a lot of things along the years. Uh, here are a few snapshots. So I'm a trained welder, uh, craftsman, jewelry designer, industrial designer. Uh, I've made quite a lot of uh, ceramics, uh, sculpture, graphic design, um, 3D printed handheld objects and so forth. So, but um, basically, for some reason, I'm known as a uh, nahka juhani, <laughs> letter juhani, uh, and that's really the material that, that has stuck with me along the years. Uh, this is what I'm basically known for. Uh, I did for a living for some years uh, letter armor, uh, wax har hardened leather armor. Uh, so molded, uh, dyed, uh, wax hardened leather armor. Yeah, but today we are going to cover a lot more than just this kind of armor. Uh, then a quick safety notice. <laughs> so today we are going to talk a lot about uses of uh, open flame, uh, hot liquids, hot waxes, chemicals and so forth. I'm not going to talk today about uh, personal safety and wh what should be taken into account when, when doing some things like this. So bear that in mind and seek the appropriate uh, information about safe handling and so forth. Uh, that is not going to be in, in, in the focus of today's presentation. So introduction, why leather? Uh, the argument that I feel like most of my clients have used and I have used when I'm using leather armor is that it, it has good weight to performance ratio. Uh, it, it has good availability. It requires almost next to no tools to work with. Uh, it's versatile, malleable, easy to shape. And uh, my personal favorite, uh, like this is uh, subjective, but uh, tactility and aesthetics b play a big part why leather is a fascinating material to me. And perhaps historically price has been also uh, beneficial for leather, uh, perhaps not so much today as thick armor grade leather is not, not a commodity anymore. Um, short version of wha what is leather? So it consists of collagen protein, and uh, it comes uh, in bundles of various varying sizes. So the biggest unit of collagen uh, that is visible to the eye also 
is uh, the fiber and it goes to smaller and smaller bundles until we have the backbone chain uh, very similar to DNI molecule except here we have three chains instead of two. And uh, leather has also significant amounts of water even when it's uh, completely dry and that's important in this context. Uh, here's a quick look on the cross section of leather. So basically the side of the leather that's facing upwards in this presentation uh, is the grain side uh, or in, in Finnish karvapuoli or pintapuoli. So that, that's the uh, side of the material that faces outside. And flesh side, side is self-explanatory. So it was the side that faces the uh, flesh of the animal it's taken from. Uh, so basically when, when you have ve vegetable tanned leather, you have just collagen and water. There, there are no, for example, epidermis layer is removed. So you can uh, mechanically grind leather and you, you don't breach any uh, layers. You just get from tight bundles of leather to loose bundles of leather or collagen. Important uh, bit of information is that uh, when the leather is dry for practical intents and purposes, it has around 40%, uh, 14 percent water in it. Uh, it's divided between uh, chemically bound water and multilayer free water that moves in and out uh, from the letter uh, as uh, relative humidity of the environment changes. So in addition to this, so this is kind of dry letter, then you can uh, of course wet it and that almost doubles its weight, uh, uh, roughly speaking. And one important concept in leather armoring or leather in general is the shrinkage temperature. So when you expose leather to uh, heat and moisture, it, it will start shrinking. Uh, it will get darker, the fibers will get shorter, it, it will get harder uh, and less malleable. And this shrinkage temperature is inversely proportional to the amount of water in it. So if we have completely wet leather, the shrinkage temperature is lower, and if we have completely dry leather, it's uh, much higher. And today, we are interested in rawhide, so that is raw, untanned skin of an animal, which has uh, flesh and, and hair removed. So, and leather, which is tanned uh, skin of the, an, an animal. So as we can see, when we have dry hide or dry leather, the shrinkage temperature is um, higher for raw hide and lower for tanned leather. And this uh, relationship is inversed around, around 80 degrees when the moisture content is right. So playing with these zones, kind of, so we have in the A zone here, we have an area where if you have a material uh, where we have rawhide and leather. In the A zone, we have a rawhide that is shrinking, or leather that is shrinking, and rawhide that is not shrinking. And, and the B zone, where, where leather is shri shrinking, but the rawhide is not. Oh, just vice versa. Anyway, uh, and uh, when we have a multi material, uh, material like partially tanned leather, uh, it's important to know these zones and limits. So maybe this slide should have been before. So leather is fully tanned material. It's supple, soft, and porous. Uh, then we have partially tanned leather, which is basically we don't fully tan the material. We start tanning it, and we, we uh, stop the tanning process before it has reached the full cross-section of the material. So uh, we have face sheets of uh, tanned material and in the middle we have rawhide section. Uh, and finally, we have rawhide, which is completely untanned dried skin. And basically mechanical properties of rawhide are better than with leather. And uh, which means logically that leather is not actually a very good armoring material. 
So I don't think you expected to hear this today. <laughs> uh, but there are other reasons why we would want to tan at least part of the material. Uh, for example, rawhide is uh, susceptible to uh, degradation, from, uh, uh, so it gets bad if it's exposed to uh, moisture and so on. Uh, and it reacts with moisture uh, a lot stronger than leather. So uh, I, I'm having a one slide about that later, but basically Mechanically speaking, rawhide is the superior material, but from, from practical perspective, you want to have tanned material, at least on the uh, uh, face sheets that are exposed to moisture and so forth. So it won't get bad, it won't get distorted and so on. So basically, uh, how leather is made, uh, we have the skin of the animal is prepared. There are a series of steps so the tanning gets all the attention, but it's important to note that there are a whole host of uh, process steps that precede and, and uh, come after tanning. Pre-tanning operations are known as beam house operations. Then there is the tanning process itself and some post-tanning things like finishing the material. Uh, yeah, but in industrial processes, there are like process steps like unhairing, fleshing, and, and many times also splitting. So we, we split the letter in, in two or more layers. So that means from armorer's perspective, the letter is almost never uh, thick enough. <laughs> and if you are, have industrial processes with splitting involved, we want to layer the letter. Uh, but uh, then we come to the idea of using partially tanned leather. I spoke with an traditional master tanner uh, w uh, on this topic and she thought that the hardened leather in a way is uh, almost an oxymoron. It doesn't make sense because the whole point of uh, tanning process is to, is to make the material porous, soft and supple. So these are the exact opposites we want to achieve when we want to make good armor. Uh, and rawhide really is superior when speaking mechanically. Uh, but yeah, partial tanning makes sense because we can protect the material from moisture uh, and, and so forth. And together we kind of came up to the same conclusion that uh, if we really want to make the best possible hide-based material, uh, then it should have to be basically uh, partially tanned leather, and the context in which uh, this kind of material could be make, made uh, that would be viable to make is uh, traditional tanning, because that's a process where you make everything by hand, sourced from the local wilderness with small batches and so forth. It wouldn't make sense today to make an industrial process just to make good armoring material. <laughs> but with traditional tanning, we get the right framework for it. So basically, this term is coined by me. You, if you Google that, you won't get any hits. <laughs> but uh, the idea is that uh, with typical uh, partially tanned leather, we have a kind of uh, one thirds and one thirds and one thirds. So we have uh, two thirds of tanned material, then we have one thirds of rawhide in the middle. But if we m just make the uh, tanning li liquid so strong that it causes a shock reaction to the um, surface of the material. It, it, it kind of uh, tans from the very thin layer in, in, in the exposed areas and the tanning process stops there. It doesn't get deeper than with typical uh, partially tanned leather. And I've, uh, this is kind of, um, I haven't seen this concept employed but, but many people who have made tanning by hand, uh, can, this can, cause, can be caused accidentally. And I really think this is probably the best material you could make from, from animal hide. But you cannot get this material commercially. Yeah, so 
here's a visualization. So the mm, pink area represents the uh, rawhide parts of pr uh, partially tanned leather in a typical case. So if we use the framework of uh, traditional tanning, and we are more careful about not, not removing material during the process, and we just cause the shock reaction uh, on the surface, then we can get a lot thicker material, and we can get a lot stronger material. That gets us to uh, mechanical properties. I'm also a mechanical engineer, uh, so this is close to my heart. <laughs> Basically, uh, this lecture's topic is about hardened leather, but that's also quite misleading because there are many more properties we are interested in when we think of performance of leather armor. So hardness is one. It can be measured. So it's defined basically a measure of materials resistance to localized plastic deformation. So in other words, scratching it. So, uh, and uh, how well it resists abrasion. Uh, the MOH scale for minerals is probably the known scale for hardness, but for hardened leather, the shore D scale would be advisable. Uh, more about that later. Then we have strength, uh, and this is actually several values that are determined for a material. The most important, which are yield strength. So uh, that's the amount of strength it takes to uh, re irreversibly deform a material. So if we start bending something uh, and we don't apply enough force and uh, we stop bending, it will uh, spring back to its original shape. But strength is, uh, yield strength is the point where it will permanently deform. And then ultimate tensile strength is the point where the material fails, uh, the highest amount of stress that can be applied it before it starts failing. Then here we have stiffness, which is a different thing. Uh, this expresses uh, how the material behaves in the elastic region. So if we don't apply enough uh, stress to make permanent deformation, stiffness is the property we are uh, interested in. Then we have ductility and brittleness, which are the opposite of each other. So ductility is the uh, material's ability to deform plastically without breaking. Uh, and brittleness expresses in which manner the material breaks. So if, if something breaks, like ceramic plate, if we break it, there's no pl plastic uh, deformation when it breaks. So either it's, it's broken or it's not broken, but there's no middle ground. And finally, we have toughness, which is a different thing altogether. It's the combination of strength and ductility. So basically, the total amount of energy material can absorb before a failure. That's a very short uh, lecture on mechanical properties and what we are interested in, in this context. Couple of uh, figures, I'm not going into specifics, uh, but here's an example about hardness testing. So basically uh, how hardness testing works is that we have this kind of devices with metal intenders with a, to push the intender into the material and we get the value of hardness. And um, yeah, so basically we cannot have a material with all, all the optimal mechanical properties. We need to consider trade-offs. So making leather armor is very much about considering the trade-offs. If we have a very uh, hard material, it's probably not going to be very tough. For example, diamonds, the hardest material uh, that naturally occur here are not very tough or, or strong material. So an improvement in one property comes at the cost of another, uh, yeah. So now we are approaching the actual topic of today about kuabuli uh, or however it's pronounced, kuirbouli in Finnish. <laughs> and hardened leather. So what these terms actually mean is not very clear. Uh, many times they are used interchangeable and uh, the most often they refer to in a very ambiguous way to uh, hard or otherwise rigid molded leather objects typical for armoring 
but are not exclusively even used in this context. So you can see like drinking vessels uh, or something like that made from kurboli. Um, kurboli is a Norman French term. Uh, it can be translated literally as boiled letter, but uh, the etymology goes a, a, a bit farther than that. It could be also translated something like uh, boiled hide or boiled skin. So it necessarily doesn't uh, doesn't uh, refer to leather or tanned material, and it's problematic uh, in a way because uh, first of all, it, its use is extremely ambiguous. It's very contested term in its meaning, and it refers literally to only one method of hardening leather, and uh, probably also the most disputed method of all. Method of all. Then again, hardened leather is also problematic because it refers only to one mechanical property. We are also interested in stiffness, strength, toughness, uh, ductility, and brittleness, for example. Uh, so it's a, a bit misleading also, but that's the term I'm going to go with because mm, that's the least contested term and, and most used in this context. Yeah. So, we arrive to making of armor. Do you have at this point any comments or questions? Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about the fact that leather has so much water in it. Is it how the leather very much if you are in like freezing temperatures for like very long time, a lot of that water freezes up and it then gets like get all that water? That, that is a good and interesting question. I don't have a good answer to that. But uh, in practical terms, I think leather reacts very well to changes in temperature. But yeah, that, that is a good point to make. Any else? Anybody else? Yeah, okay. Let's move to the more practical parts. So just a very general comment. Uh, I've made also steel armor in the past, and I would be uh, making leather armor very similar to that. I don't see, there are fu fundamental differences, but basically I view this, them as mm, very much the same thing. But one thing that stands out with leather is that the materials involved are much thicker. So it makes shaping and, and making parts that move in relation to each other and uh, making very small parts not, not so viable with leather than with steel. Okay, lumber type leather armor is maybe a one exception to that. Uh, another thing is that uh, if we are honest about it, mechanical properties of leather are quite modest when we compare to steels. Uh, and this historically and in practice in modern day combat like in SCEA context uh, is uh, compensated by making laminated structures to, so having two or three layers of the material instead of one and composite constructions and layers. We'll come to that later. Uh, then I think one of the best parts with leather uh, it's the fact that I mentioned earlier is that it requires next to no tools to shape with. So if you basically have a good cutting board and a knife that can be maintained sharp, this is what I've used 10 years, <laughs> like the cheapest possible knife from, from the local store, and you can just change the blades rapidly uh, and uh, often that's good enough. You basically don't need everything, anything else than just your hands. So maybe some beneficial things would be, uh, first of all, something to make holes with, but most of all, knife, good ergonomics, good lighting, and of course, leather and some access to water. If you want to make something practical, probably you want to have something to rivet uh, pieces of leather together or uh, chew them by hand. But not much more than that. Uh, I'm not really a fan of, of having a lot of tools when doing leather work. Unless you want to go very decorative, that's all you need. Parts of the hide. So leather is um, 
is not a uniform material, it's organic, it, it has different directions. Here's a picture of a half hide, which is very typical unit leather is sold in. So in the top, you'll see the spine. The hide is cut into two along the spine, and that's the half hide. You have uh, three distinct parts, at least three, that you're interested in. Uh, first of all, there are predominant fiber directions, which are expressed in this picture. I would say that as an armor, I've never uh, made too much of a use of, of that information because just looking for def defects in the material and avoiding them and, and making the best possible and most economic possible use of the material has constrained my use. But uh, for example, in shoe making, they are extremely important. Uh, first, there are the sections divided. First, we have the bend, which is the most consistent, densest part of the fiber. So this is the prime material uh, and a lot more uh, usable for armoring than some of the other parts. So definitely reserve this for the best possible armor parts you're going to make, uh, and especially if you're making single layer structures that need to really carry their own weight and take some beating. Then we have the shoulder. Uh, it's very similar to bend. There are larger variants in thickness and quality of the, these parts. Uh, so kind of can be used similar to bend, but with some caution. So check for defects and so forth. And finally, ha we have the belly, which uh, much of it is uh, really poor material. I it can be uh, lack all the structural strength to shape it and uh, to hold its own, own weight. So as an armor, I, I really dislike this section. Uh, and uh, I prefer reserving the use of belly for secondary layers only, or even skip its use altogether on, on leather armor, with some exceptions. Yeah. Uh, if you buy leather that is <coughs> cut to a certain thickness, mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm sp th this is applies especially to fully tanned materials. Okay. And the one thing I, I would advise is that if you have enough money, you buy half a height instead of smaller parts. Because if you go to a shoemaker and buy, buy their sekal and lajitelma of all sorts of parts, you are going to get belly. <laughs> 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 yeah, I would say the bend area is at least twi twice as valuable as belly. Okay, then we have arrived to my favorite topic, which is wet forming, and uh, especially free form shaping. So uh, for on leather armor, this is in my opinion, the bread and butter of making leather armor. So basically you take the material, you dampen it, it mildly, you don't wet it, uh, you just apply enough uh, enough moisture so it become malleable and you can shape it. Uh, yeah, the good thing about this is it requires no tools. You can use your hands. So some practical tips I include that you should always wash your hands off from grease and uh, uh, nail your fu fingernails short, cut and nail them even and soft because you're otherwise going to leave marks to your material especially if you're trying to color it later, it won't absorb uh, evenly if you have grease in your hands when you've done this. Yeah, and if the maker is the same as the user, which is many times the case, you, you can just form the leather around your own body parts and do all the movements you require when, when you want to use the armor to check that if your movement is constrained and so forth. Yeah, and uh, important thing with this, or very useful thing, is to have some basic geometries like ceramic plates that you can use to preliminarily shape the leather. So you take a ball, you shape it, uh, the leather into a, a double curvature form, and then you s keep shaping it further. It really m makes it 
a lot easier and, and stronger constructions. So just add moisture regularly, for example, with a spray bottle. The leather should be damp, but not thoroughly wet, so it can hold its shapes, uh, shape when you shape it. If it's too wet, it won't hold its own weight and, and, and so forth. So many times uh, when you go to see tutorials about shaping leather or making leather works, you, you see these tips that you should immerse the leather in water for five minutes or 10 minutes or so forth. That is absolutely bullshit. You don't want to do that, it will get too wet. Uh, I made some tests and around one to two seconds is uh, the correct amount for, for leather with thickness of around three or three and a half millimeters. It depends also which section from the height is taken from. If you have belly, it will get too wet uh, very soon. If you have bent, you will need uh, re-wetting re uh, it regularly as you shape it. Uh, then the other thing is lasting. Uh, so basically using tools for shaping. Uh, this takes some time and effort. Uh, um, so, but you can get a lot more consistent shapes and uh, this is also a lot easier to do, do than freeform shaping. So for example, here you have a positive mold half, which is a copy of my face. Uh, I've do, done many masks just using this one half and, and doing the shaping combined with the mold and by hand. But you can also have a stretching tool or some sort of pressing tool. And historically speaking, wooden formers like the shoe maker makers use lasts. So similar idea, you have leather, you wet it, you stretch it and you nail it rigidly, fix it on its edges to the wooden uh, former. This is made from plaster, so that kind of approach wouldn't work with this mold. Yeah, and, and in this case, you can use thoroughly wet leather. So um, a word that is coined at, at, um, sometimes in this context is samming. So the leather is thoroughly wetted, then it's uh, allowed to, uh, the moisture is allowed to soak in uh, and even out, uh, so it, it's not that, wet that it exudes water when squeezed, but wet enough so it has good malleability and moldability. And here's the same mold uh, a, a bit uh, improved, so I, I made the second half of the mold, and so I could really m m use it a bit differently than with just the one half. Uh, why wet forming is important? I've said that uh, at least in wax hardened leather armor, which is my, was my, my thing in the past, uh, I used to say that wet forming might be probably the more important step than the actual wax hardening, because this is where you get the geometric stiffness to, to your armor. So when you're talking about stiffness, there are two types of stiffness. Uh, one is geometric stiffness, so it's universal shape-related property. And it's purely mathematical thing, you can just calculate an object's geometric stiffness. And it has no direct correlation with material stiffness, which is the second thing. So the material structure itself can be stiff or not stiff, and the shape itself can be stiff or not stiff. Uh, Leather is an ideal material for making geometrically stiff constructions because it's so easy to shape. Okay, maybe I'm a bit biased to say that, but uh, it's really, for example, if you convert it with metals or so forth, you just need some water on your hands and that's it. Uh, so it's easy to do. Uh, and especially complex double curvature shapes, they produce the most rigid uh, shapes so you should try to aim always for them. So if you think of the piece of leather armor you have, you should never have just single curvature shapes or flat sheets of leather, which produce the least uh, uh, geometric stiffness possible. Yeah, especially important is, is about blunt impacts. So stiffness r resists the armor from deforming from impacts and uh, in modern use, because we don't use leather armor for against lethal attacks, I hope <laughs> this is especially important. So, uh, example, 
this is flat sheet, uh, flat sheet uh, low stiffness geometric shape. If we want to improve it, we uh, bend it to single curvature. Uh, even better, and a lot better actually, is double curvature. And if we want to take the extra mile, uh, then we make some complexity added to it. Um, this helps a lot uh, for the shape to ke keep itself and then take a beating. And if we bring these shapes to armor, these same principles uh, can be easily applied. So uh, if we think of cuirass, there we have a, like some sort of straw man of a cuirass on the left, just straight plates. Uh, and uh, th that's very low stiffness armor. Then we have something that resembles uh, Loriga seg segmentata from Roman armor. Really low stiffness construction, really bad when it comes to stiffness. I'm no, no historian, but I would imagine that making shapes like that can be justified from economic perspective. It's easy to do massive amounts of s uh, such shapes. shapes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, the, the form itself is very flat. But yeah, I, I, I've noticed that too. And that, that must be the exact reason why it's don't. It's a lot stiffer. Uh, and the next step w would be the uh, lorica musculata. Kind of, there are forms that come from the anatomy, but all of that is not necessary from anatomical perspective when you make armor but it produces higher stiffness, so it's advisable. And then you have something that resembles maybe floating in Maximilian armor, so you uh, add these flutes to add stiffness. And uh, demi countered example from the same thing. Yeah, so basically avoid at all times, don't do this with leather. If you have some material that cannot be actually shaped to your will, like bone, then it's understandable that you end up with shapes like this. Or if you really m need to make uh, high volumes or, or, or just uh, costume armor, then go for something like this. And my, my beef with a lot of commercial leather armor is that they look like this. They are, sh from the perspective of geometric shape, they are really low quality armor and you can see really high end decorative, really well made leather armor that looks like this when from its basic shape. Yeah, and this is what I'd really recommend using as the default option. It's not really that hard to come up with something like this and you can mm, get relatively high stiffnesses to compensate for the modest mechanical properties of the uh, of leather. And this is something that takes a lot of effort and skill and time. So if you can go the extra mile, mile it, it can be worth it, but this is the default I would advise for to going for. Uh, if you are using a anatomical clothing like, let's say, like a tunic, mm. Yeah, good question. Depends on, on, on the style and um, what's it intended for and so forth. But yeah, uh, my typical process, wet forming, anything is that I st start with a very large yeah, dish, shallow. shallow dish, yeah. So you can, uh, I take the mm, mm, letter there and I shape it in the shallow, shallow three-dimensional form. So you have some geometric stiffness already, and then you can keep working from that. And it also depends on what, what's the full suite of armor you're going for. If you have a, a brazier, but don't have an elbow cup, then you can add some uh, forms that curve outside if you don't ha have the elbow cup, but if you have an elbow well, cup, it will constrain your movement too much. So it depends a bit. But uh, here's an example of a demi gauntlet I made some years ago. So basically, it's kind of, the basic shape is double curved everywhere, uh, and 
I added a little bit of uh, that extra with, with the going for the knuckles. It wasn't necessary for, for from practical perspective, but it adds rigidity to this. And this is especially important when doing just single layer construction. So this is just one sheet of leather and not like laminated. Yeah. So the next thing is laminating. This has been actually a uh, quite widespread uh, practice historically. So many times in historical hide-based armor, you don't see just one layer of uh, raw hide or leather. You, you may encounter two or three layers. So, uh, and you see this, for example, in the SCI leather armor, uh, the, mm, the most, uh, at least the very typical construction is there to ha have at least two layers of thick leather. Uh, so this can be done, for example, by gluing, by sewing, or, or by riveting or, or combining these methods together. And uh, this has an as additional benefit because leather, the two sides are not uh, equal in, with leather. We have that nice, clean, dense, even, uh, grain side and then we have the rougher uh, more loose uh, less dense uh, flesh side so when we bond two layers of leather together we can get rid of flesh sides that are exposed to the user and that also adds to the uh, rigidity of the construction e especially if we are gluing something because if we are using mechanical adhes adhesives like uh, animal glues it's very beneficial to have the glue applied on a very uh, not even uneven surface like the flesh side. So it makes an ideal surface for applying mechanical adhesives. Yeah, and especially par using partially tanned leather for this purpose is a special case that uh, I want to highlight because when you have the raw, raw cores of two layers of partially tanned leather, they are the kind of near the outermost layers. So you can have a kind of a, a sandwich style composite layer where you have strong layers uh, as a face sheets, and then you have a less dense material in the middle. And that way you can make very rigid construction considering the materials you started with. Stitch formation, uh, some examples. Uh, what I want to highlight here is the saddle stitch. So basically, uh, when you're doing two layers of leather together, you want to have two needles and you go uh, and uh, stretch them at the same time from both sides so you can nice, even, tight uh, stitching. Then we can also use the, it to reinforce our constructions. Here are a few ideas how you can do that with leather armor. Uh, and what I want to highlight here are the rolled edges. Just like with steel armor, you may want to ro uh, roll your edges of leather armor, or if you can't make uh, armor completely seamless, you might, may want to use a reinforced seam there to make sure that it's not the, uh, it's not the kind of, it won't be the weak point of your armor. Then we have some historically important concepts. No, hard facing. Uh, uh, this is a modern term that is used in the context of welding, but, but this has been also a very widespread uh, practice historically. So we are adding a hard layer, for example, filings from iron or crushed uh, ceramics or sand, and then we uh, make a matrix around it, for example, from hide glued and we, we apply the paste on top of the leather. So we have a hard layer that is not strong or tough, but uh, it can resist piercing from sharp weapons. Uh, then we have gesso. Uh, it's been used for many thousands of years actually, and uh, traces of gesso can be seen from um, many extant uh, hide-based armor. So historically, and today also in painting, uh, it's used as base. So it's a go good base for, for making the painting or gilding or silvering. And gesso can in itself provide also a modest hard facing layer. So it's uh, relatively hard uh, substance. And you can get gesso 
uh, good gesso for armoring by mixing hide glue uh, with chalk powder. Then we have paints, uh, which has been the prevalent uh, type of coloring uh, leather armor, uh, historically speaking. And it, it seems to me that many times the purpose seems to have been to hide the fact that uh, it is hide-based material. So it probably wasn't as desirable to, to have uh, armor that looked like it's made from leather or rawhide. So many times leather armor has been covered with uh, paints perhaps to make it look like a hide the fact that it's made from from leather. For example, the Japanese did uh, uh, lamellar armor, a, a lot of that kind of lamellar armor where they alternated between iron plates and rawhide plates, but because they had so many co coats of lacquer on top of it, it's uh, indistinguishable from, from each other. So you can tell which lamels from a Japanese lamella or, or rawhide and, and iron unless you x-ray it or, or some, something like that. So medieval paints, uh, I'm not really an expert on this matter, but uh, substances known at the time were, for example, gum arabic as the binder or g gums in general and pigments from natural minerals or animals or plants. And in modern leather armor, a prevalent finish is just uh, doing them. So you apply a color, but without hiding the characteristics of the material. So the uh, philosophy behind coloring leather armor is very different today than it uh, has been historically. Uh, gilding, also a habit that is known, for example, at least dates back to ancient e Egypt. and. Uh, if we want to go uh, with the traditional route of water gilding, we take the gesso as the basis. We could use hide glue and chalk powder as well, but rabbit skin glue is uh, typical for uh, gesso for gilding. Then we apply a bowl, which is a clay-based paint, and then loose gold leaves. That has been also um, a historical practice in, in hide-based armor as well. And finally, uh, varnishes. So uh, on top of everything, we add a clear coat that protects the armor from weather and adds a glossy finish and, and uh, highlights the colors and so forth. If we have something that has rawhide or uh, animal glues, this is basically mandatory. Otherwise, the uh, armor we will get bad when it uh, gets moist. So uh, an example of a historical varnish would be the uh, of course, the Japanese lacquer is the famous thing, but in medieval Europe, uh, fixed oil varnishes would be uh, used and, uh, or, or viable for this kind of use. So, for example, linseed oil co combined with Venice turpentine. Yeah, that's about the uh, leather working in, in the armoring context in general. Any comments, thoughts at this point? So let's move on to the hardening methods, which is kind of the today's topic. So I kind of commenting earlier that uh, hardened leather is a sort of oxymoron, but we have extant examples of something that has been called corbulli, and it has been, it seems that not everything at least has been rawhide. Uh, so let's consider how to harden the leather to uh, kind of restore some of its mechanical properties from the soft, porous, and, and supple state that it, uh, it's in when it's tanned. So basically, this is how I classify hardening methods for leather. We have something that is popularly referred as water hardening uh, or heat-assisted forming, uh, which is divided basically into the, the two things. First, we have the literally boiled leather or, or more generally put uh, leather that is exposed to hot water, or this can be called also wet heat. So we have techniques such as full immersion, which is the typical one, or partial immersion, or, or scalding, so basically pouring hot water to spot harden or to harden just one side of the leather. Then we have use of hot air or baking, and we have several methods here. 
uh, oven slash heater would be the uh, most typical one but also on hotel or climate sun drying can get some very modest results or smoking so if you have an open fire and you keep the hide on top of it for it to get heated or even direct exposure to flame then we have uh, what i refer as stuffing this is term probably not many of you have heard in this context many times uh, we speak of wax hardening but uh, basically the idea of stuffing is to add another material that fills in the gaps between the fibers and it's popularly done with waxes but it, it's not the only one that can be used here uh, uh, especially as a historical practice it seems that glue based stuffing has been actually the prevalent one and historically the, the correct one also but uh, also we can use resins for example in uh, some sort of um, fireman's helmet from recent centuries ha had been pitched with pine pitch to make it more heat resistant and more rigid and uh, other methods i would want to mention at this point is the use of brine so uh, salt water it doesn't actually harden the leather but if in a very loose meaning of the term hardened leather uh, uh, i think it can be justified uh, to be added here uh, and finally mechanical hardening which is also a bit uh, questionable to be classified here so we basically compress the uh, fibers in a smaller space so the fi individual fibers have less uh, movement available to, to them so it makes a more rigid material and we can achieve th that for example by hammering or by making de decorative tooling uh, so the compression comes as a byproduct of making the decorations and wet forming if we make heavy double curvature forms we basically get areas where the fibers are very densely uh, next to each other so first of all boiling leather is exposed to hot water you can immerse it you can pour hot water in it or you can just partially immerse it typically the springage temperature of wet leather is 75 to 85 de degrees so that is what if, if you go for this route uh, i would recommend using temperatures very close to that range or on that range because if you add literally boiling water the changes are very rapid and it's a lot harder to control so basically this is very controversial method of doing hardening of leather and there's also a lot of data that that support the claim that it is, this may not be very viable when doing leather armor not at least as the only way and not at least when the wall cross section is affected because this produces uh, hard and stiff results but also very brittle ones so uh, as a result we don't have very tough material uh, we need to concern not harden at least the wall cross section maybe add uh, glue that holds two layers of leather together uh, and this way we, we, we maybe can achieve good leather armor but just one layer of literally boiled leather is not viable a material for armor use yeah so basically if you boil leather long enough the collagen fibers will uh, transition into gelatin so this is basically how you get get animal glue I, if you have raw hide that you boil long enough it will completely lose its fibers and just uh, transforms into a gelatinous substance uh, one thing about boiled leather is its possibilities of post-processing so it's very similar to plastics or bone or hard wood you can mechanically grind it to a very fine finishes here's a experimental face guard or maybe an exhibition piece piece not really a piece of armor but uh, it has not been actually polished with in any way i just uh, ground it up to with 9000 grit sandpaper so and it gives uh, really some possibilities for for vi nice visual finishes uh, on a more practical note 
if you boil leather and you dry it, it turns into rigid hard substance, but uh, you can still reshape it by applying heat and moisture to it again. So the shrinkage of the fibers is irreversible. You, you cannot undo the changes uh, in the length of the fibers, but their orientation is not irreversible. So apply heat and, and, and water and you can reshape mm, such leather. So the here are a few uh, examples. So for the book, I, I made a series of visual samples to show the differences of different techniques. So here are a few uh, samples I made with boiling related techniques and I'm going to, uh, I have some samples here so I'm going to pass them on and you can check them for yourself. And please be careful with the samples, they might scratch each other. So try to be gentle. <laughs> okay, next thing we have is the use of hot air, so baking. Uh, leather is dried by hot air. This is typically done in temperatures like 75, 250. And you can get some stiffness out of the leather by doing something like this, but the results don't feel uh, very convincing. We have a good evidence, a good deal of evidence that something like this in the historical cure bully ha has been employed. We have evidence of a uh, letter that is, uh, there are elongated holes on the edges of the pieces of letter that are consistent with something like this. So we have a wooden former and the letter constraint from its edges. And when it has shrunk, when constrained there, you get the elongated holes. But with modern material testing with, with baked samples hasn't been very convincing and uh, it has led me to believe that at least when used as the sole hardening method, this is not uh, actually a viable armoring method either. Perhaps when you combine it with several other things we have already discussed, like doing multi-layered structures and, and uh, using animal glues and using gesso and varnishes to make it m more uh, stronger structure, uh, then baking may, may have some viability, but n not uh, as a straightforward wet the letter and dry it in an oven. It, it won't pr produce very convincing armor. Yeah, here are a picture of one of the samples I made. Uh, so basically a very crude wooden former and uh, some nailing, so it can be constrained in place during the drying process. Uh, there's the back of some baked samples we, uh, and untreated samples, and you, there are also recipes I used for making them. Okay, then we arrive with stuffing. I, I mentioned some points already. Uh, let's not go too deep into this. So basically, how I would define stuffing of letter is impregnating it with another substance, creating a rigid matrix around the fibers and removing the porosity of the material. So we fill the empty spaces with some other material that complements the, the mechanical properties of the fibers. Uh, and a, a good uh, comparison here is uh, fiber reinforced plastics. So for example, what we call fiber glass popularly. We have glass fibers in, in a plastic matrix. So the fibers serve as, uh, they, they introduce high tensile strength to the material and the uh, matrix fills in the gaps and helps transform the energies through the material. And stuffing can be divided between thermal and non-thermal stuffing. So if we apply with low uh, temperatures the stuffing material, we don't ha get any shrinkage of the letter. So it serves just a, as a matrix creation. But if we apply also enough heat, then we can also stuff the material but also shrink it and harden it at the same time. So we can have waxes, 
we can have glues or we can have resins or, or maybe some other materials, but these are the three groups of materials we are uh, at least mostly interested in. And this is kind of a thin red line when you can call something like this, just coating the letter or, or stuffing the letter and it's partly artificial. If you apply something on the grain side, it's probably so thin that it becomes a coating. Uh, but if you apply it thoroughly or all sides or from the flesh sides, the material will absorb a lot more of, of the another substance. So wax hardening, basically we immerse the letter when it's completely dry. Do not try this if it's not dried, you, you will get nasty results. So you have complete dry re results. You have uh, wet formed it into a shape, then you dry it, then you immerse uh, it in a hot wax. So you impregnate the material with it. Yeah. The, when speaking of historical evidence, we basically have none that th this kind of techniques were involved. Apart from some 16th to 19th century firemen's helmets and porters hats, which were pitched with pine pitch. And th this seems to have been at least the best reference I'm aware of. Uh, all that and this uh, wax hardening has been used a lot uh, for many millennia, at least for drinking vessels and so forth. But uh, for its use in armoring is, is something we don't have any evidence of. But that doesn't mean it isn't a useful concept. It's immensely popular in SCI and, and, and some other forms of uh, modern sword play. And uh, uh, there are good reasons to it. Uh, first of all, it's extremely easy to do. It's uh, ar armor like this is carefree. Uh, and it's also practically indestructible if you use it uh, only against blunt weapons. So. They will deform in use if you hit with, with uh, for example, rattan sticks in SCA, but you can just heal it by applying uh, heat and pressure and it's good as new. So uh, they are uh, practically indestructible. Yeah, most typical waxes are beeswax, which is a shitty option for stuffing leather. Don't use this. <laughs> It produces soft and not very stiff leather. Uh, I was actually shocked when I uh, started making some material test how bad beeswax is as a stuffing agent. Uh, but this is kind of uh, the popular choice because it's viewed as a historically viable but not mechanically very poor material. Then we have paraffin, obviously not very historically viable material. and but in addition to it not being historically viable, it's also mechanically a really shitty material to stuff leather with. So avoid at all costs, don't use paraffin in when doing leather armor, period. <laughs> uh, the, it, it's quite soft, not as soft as beeswax, and it has modest stiffness. And most critically, you have some high melt point paraffin waxes, but most of the paraffin waxes you, you get are very low melt point. So even in Finnish summer, which is not exceptionally hot, <laughs> you, you will get your letter armor will melt in the direct sunlight. So the better options are first carnauba wax. This comes from Brazil, not very viable option historically when speaking of medieval Europe. Uh, but uh, anyway, quite expensive. Nice smell, uh, really hard material. Uh, this is actually the hardest uh, natural wax we have. And uh, uh, it has also a very high melting point. So you don't get the melting or sweating leather armor when using carnauba wax. And, and finally, my personal recommendation is stearic acid. Historically a viable material, natural material good mechanical properties, uh, easy to apply uh, and reasonable uh, uh, cheap material. Carnauba wax is the most expensive one of these. It has some practical problems. It's harder to apply. 
stearic acid and beeswax are kind of similarly priced, at least in Finland, and, and paraffin is the cheapest. So the only reason you should use paraffin is if it is to, to the only option you can afford, but not, not much better than that. Immersion temperature. So uh, I mentioned that when we have thoroughly wet leather, the uh, te uh, shrinkage temperature is something like 75. But this is not true with dry leathers. So when we do wax hardening, we have dry leather. So basically, here are some comparable pictures about samples I made with different beeswax temperatures. Uh, so kind of 62, 63 uh, is the melting point of beeswax. So this is what you get if you try to have 62 degree beeswax and leather in it. This is 70 degrees, uh, 80 degrees. Uh, at this point, 90 degrees, 100 degrees. At this point, you, you can see that most of the wax has actually, um, there are no extra wax uh, that, that ha has been built on top of the leather. Uh, so around 100 degrees is the lowest I would go with beeswax when, when hardening leather. Then again, I wouldn't use beeswax. <laughs> uh, and then at some point around 120, 130, you can see that these pieces have started to deform. So these have been uh, exactly all of one minute in this temperature. So around at this point, you can see that the pieces have been deformed, not, not, not in, in a catastrophic way. But if you wa want to be safe about it, around 100 degrees, once again, is, is the way to go. Mechanically speaking, maybe 120, 130 might be beneficial. After that, it starts deforming aggressively. And finally, we have uh, at 170 degrees a crumbled be piece of leather and 160 degrees. So do not go as high as that. That's not safe. <laughs> I did it for science. <laughs> anyway. But the temperatures you can use depends on the stuffing agent or mix you, you're using. For example, with carnabavax or stearic acid, these temperatures are a bit different. But this goes on to show that if you have a uh, uh, dry letter, for example, 150, if you don't do an extended period of immersion, uh, it can be actually pretty fine. Even it's a lot higher than the shrinkage temperature of wet letter. Yeah, and this is one of the best properties of wax 100 leather. So here is a material test I made many years ago, uh, some shaping exercise. I wax hard on it. It's, uh, and then I beat it with hammer uh, and bend it very aggressively. To, uh, and this is what you see here is that the wax has crumbled under the pressure and hits from a hammer. And you can very visibly see that it has taken some damage. But the cool thing about wax hardened leather is that uh, no, this damage you see here is only uh, damage to the waxes. The fibers are actually completely intact here. So just taking a hair dryer and reheating the uh, wax here, you can heal the texture and basically return it to the state it once was. So here it's reshaped back to its original form and uh, by he reshaping it heating with the heat gun or hair dryer in this case. And finally, I wanted to see if any fibers were actually damaged. So I hammered it uh, with a polished hammer to an even surface uh, and then did another round of wax immersion. And this is a macro picture from the area that was most affected uh, by the hammering. So I could not find any damaged fibers in this picture. Uh, and I think it's a really cool examples of how you can recover wax handed leather and why it's uh, practically indestructible. Then different waxes, you get different results. This is carnauba wax. I had to be really careful when making this piece so it wouldn't shrink too much uh, during the hardening. So I had to have two uh, two cool of wax and it didn't absorb into the material so you can end up with something like this. And because I didn't want to risk any further shrinkage, I mechanically removed the wax. So that's one problem of using carnauba wax. 
and then another thing because dyeing leather wax sanded leather is pretty common is it darkens the leather quite a lot so in, in top left corner you shall see completely undyed leather and the another picture on the right is is when it has been wax hardened so you dye the leather you get all these nice colors but you get a lot darker and many times not so nice colors out of wax hardening so that's one thing to keep in mind mind when doing wax, wax hardening okay then yeah there are the wax hardened samples let's go forward next thing with stuffing would be doing that with goose so this in particular has been a historically widespread concept so but uh, likely most of the time it ha has not been used as a matrix creation but uh, actually serve other purposes primarily so bonding two or more layers together or using glues as part of gesso or hard facing substances or fiber reinforced glass gesso so basically we add fibers to the gesso and we get uh, more strength to, to our material yeah Uh, a word to keep in mind in this context is thermoplasticity so with waxes you have thermoplastic materials that means that they can be reshaped re by reheating them and then we have thermoset materials so animal glues are thermoplastic also so you can if they crack the glue itself you can reheat it uh, and it's fine after that but for example, if you have plastics like in fiber reinforced plastics or casein glue, which is one glue that might be relevant historically also, they are thermoset. So once they are set, they can cannot be reshaped. Yeah. And animal glues alongside waxes are thermoplastic. Here, here are the uh, glue stuffed samples. I think I will start running out of time if I go through all the slides. So I'm going to be a bit creative with my slides from now on. Then we have the mechanical hardening. You can kind of have half the thickness of uh, leather by just hammering it. This increases uh, surprisingly much the stiffness the material has. So not maybe a hardening technique literally, but it can result in a stiffer material. Uh, another thing was the uh, use of brine. You can make the material thicker by using uh, uh, strong salt uh, water. Uh, so it feels bulkier, it feels thicker, but uh, and feels more rigid, but it doesn't actually get uh, harder. But th this is something that uh, the leather industry actually uses when they thicken bulk bulk le leather. So using salts. One uh, curiosity that I've encoured, encoured, this is a rare brace or upper arm protection uh, I've been using for the past 10 years. And something interesting has happened to it during those years. So I'm pretty sure that it is thicker and heavier and harder than it was when I first made it. And what I suspect has happened is incremental brine hardening. So. I, I don't use gambeson or anything like that when using this armor. So I've sweated to it countless of times. And I suspect that the salts from sweat have actually hardened during the years. Then we move on to partially tanned leather. Uh, if you watch the pictures, here are some, one just wet formed, one baked in a low temperature, one b uh, hardened with beeswax, another with stearic acid. Then we have some boiled uh, partially tanned leather. So this looks very similar to fully tanned one, but uh, mechanically speaking is uh, a lot better than just, uh, just pure fully tanned material. Now, if you have really checked the uh, previous samples, uh, I think you might be surprised with w uh, some of these when you grab them.
especially uh, this boiled one is uh, the most difficult uh, all all samples you are going to get today and finally rawhide so very different this is very crude material i got from a friend so he basically rot the material to get rid uh, rid of the hair it had then he nailed it to a barn wall to dry <laughs> and it has some traces of hair and and flesh and and grease in it so they are a bit nasty but extremely convin uh, convincing uh, samples when thinking of the mechanical properties The white one you can see on the bottom row is actually made from dog chew. So you know these dog chew toys, they are made from rawhide. Pretty industrial material, it doesn't have a characteristic of a hide-based material, but they are actually surprisingly convincing as well. So some uh, thoughts about historical armor. We have uh, some uh, pictorial and textual evidence about hide-based materials in armoring. Uh, I would be, if not most famous, at least most interesting example of uh, such armor is the Kyrgyz arms from King René's tournament book. So it's basically a rule book from the 2014-61, depicting rules and what so sort of fashion you should wear in, in this king's tournament. And there's this, this illustration of this piece. Uh, uh, one of the more explicit references we have to leather armor. Yeah, and this was intended to be used as uh, uh, blunt weapons, so much like in today's sword play, uh, we have something that needs to protect about uh, against blunt weapons. I made some sketches and, and there's some work in progress of a replica I made for my kid about the uh, this armor. I'm going to finish this uh, shortly. Uh, very interesting reference to this. Then we have uh, actually a surprising amount of historical recipes. For example, uh, Islamic author, medieval author, Al Tarsusi, I have no idea how to pronounce it, <laughs> uh, described several recipes of hide based armor, from which uh, this particular one is, is uh, one of the more interesting ones. So we have basically some scrap and leftover materials from which a composite armor is made from. So instead of reading the description, I'm going to read my interpretation of the construction. So whenever I show these pictures, the exterior face is on the top and interior face is on the bottom. So in this altar Susi's recipe from 12th century, yes, uh, we have first, we have a layer that is put against a mold. Uh, we have a positive mold. We, we add a high tensile strength layer from rack or skin. So this is basically what holds the armor together. Then we add a paste that is a mechanically balanced uh, middle layer. We have hide glue, shavings of leather, some hard particles. And we make a paste and apply it on top of this leather layer. And we add finally a third layer which is a hard facing layer, uh, uh, for example, filings uh, of iron is mentioned as a good hard facing material in this layer. So we get high hardness, we get protection from uh, sharp weapons from penetrating in further into the construction. So this is low strength layer, low, low toughness layer, but it's hard so it prevents the uh, weapon from penetrating. And then we have a high tensile strength from the layers below. Finally, we can add some decoratives, uh, paints, gilding, and so forth. And finally, uh, this concept relies heavily on using animal glues, so we need it to protect it uh, somehow. So basically, you add a layer of varnish or, or a few layers of varnish there. Another is. Uh, a shield recipe that is in the Ashmolean Museum in England. Um, there, th this is basically a shield making recipe. Uh, it's intended to be made on top of a uh, wooden construction. There's a nice video about this, and this translation is from a YouTuber, uh, Todd's workshop, Todd Cutler. 
which made the modern English translation. He has a couple of very recent nice videos about it. So you take, this is from 13th or 14th century England, and, and this is near London in the museum. So basically you take partially tanned leather. So once again, we want the raw hide to be there. We apply uh, a hard, hard facing layer, which is glue, uh, crushed glass, <laughs> really nasty material, and, and some iron particles. So we get a hard facing layer that bonds well with the flesh side of this uh, layer of partially tanned leather. Then we add another layer of partially tanned leather that seals the wall construction in a nice tasty sandwich. And once again, here is the idea of using two layers of partially tanned leather. So we get this composite sandwich construction. So medieval composite materials. Uh, then we have interesting recipe of uh, sea oaks uh, uh, from North America. This is a kind of explorer, uh, George Catlin, who described some habits of sea oaks people. Uh, and this is basically, uh, we take a buffalo's neck, uh, rawhide from it. Uh, we ma make a pit for fire. We, we get the fire going and then we stretch the uh, rawhide on top of the fire. So we, uh, this is called smoking the shield. So, well, this is also a shield making recipe, but it could just as well be made armor from it. So, yeah. No, uh, 19th century North America. So we have a thick rawhide layer uh, of buffalo's neck. We smoke it uh, and uh, we get, keep it stretched uh, and uh, there's some rituals and so forth involved. But basically the process is that we get it uh, shrinking uh, from the heat and, and we keep it stretched. We uh, have, have some pegs that uh, stretch it and once it starts shrinking, we feed it with uh, hide glue from, from made from bones of the same animal the skin is from. So we kind of keep applying hide glue and keep shrinking it until the thickness is doubled uh, and hide glue is constantly fed on it. And this is uh, described as being impenetrable material. Yeah, so basically, I don't know what to classify this, if it's, this is baking or stuffing or a uh, hybrid process that combines both, but something like that. Very interesting concept. Then we have Peo Esta of the Dene Nation, uh, also North America. No idea how to pronounce those, sorry. <laughs> so here we have rawhide from moose skin. Uh, and yeah, here we also have, first of all, not tanned material, but rawhide. And then we have a hard facing layer that we added on top of it. This is uh, 19th century Canada. So, moose skin thoroughly so soaked in water. Then we add uh, fish glue in it. And then we kind of drag it on, on, bo on the bottom of a river or a sandy shores of a river. So the uh, sand will be mixed with fish glue. Once we have made one layer of this, we will repeat the process uh, a few times. So we add hard facing layers on top of each other. Yeah, this is not a historical recipe, but uh, I want to have a special mention of Chris Dobson, who um, was master armory of Royal Armories, if my memory serves, in England. And he made a really convincing ebook as tough as old boots, boots five years ago about what he thinks is the most probably form of historical Kerbuli. And he has studied uh, first person some of the surviving pieces and arguments really convincingly his case. And basically uh, his recipe for a couple of reconstructions he made to, um, to show these techniques involved are described uh, on the side. So yeah, th this is especially for 14th century European armor. So basically what we start with, once again, is partially tanned leather. We add another layer of it by gluing it with animal glue. So once again, here we have the sandwich of partially tanned leather. 
bound together with hide glue. Then we uh, stretch it on a wooden former, uh, nail it from its edges, uh, and dry it by baking. And uh, Dobson mentioned sun drying as a possible alternative. Uh, I tried to replicate some results to back that, that off that uh, uh, baking with low temperatures would be viable, but couldn't make any convincing results. Uh, but anyway, that's wh what he suspects that is going on here. Next, we may have at some point potential reinforcements if we don't feel like uh, using hide-based material is enough. Will we add metal strips or bone or cord or li something like that? So to further reinforce this, there are some evidence, pictorial evidence and so forth about uh, this kind of practices. So metal strips were added either on the interior or on the exterior of the construction. Then we have gesso. We need to avoid metal reinforcements here. Uh, gesso uh, oxidizes in contact with metals. Next, we add the decorative layers, paints, gilding, silvering, so forth. And finally, we seal everything with a uh, couple of layers of varnishes to make it weatherproof. So with these few recipes, a few teams uh, kind of starts uh, rising. You, you see the use of animal glues, you see the use of uh, raw hide-based materials, so raw hide and, and partially tanned leather. Yeah, another recipe, the fire helmets and porters hats I mentioned. So this is a newer one, but this is a boiling-based te technique. So maybe not, not a medieval recipe or older than that, but uh, the idea is very similar. So you boil the letter when it starts to shrink, you take it off from the hot water, you stretch it on a uh, mold, and, and then you sew it when, it when it's still moist. And you may add some pine pitch or something like that. So basically you're combining boiling with, with stuffing process. Okay, that's about recipes. Uh, very good, quick glance on some surviving pieces I, I thought you might uh, find interesting. First, we have a uh, crocodile armor, cro uh, Roman crocodile armor, cuirass and helmet. This may have been ritual armor, but anyway, this is made from crocodile uh, and uh, it's rawhide style, described as uh, rawhide. So basically, you, you have the uh, crocodile skin that is just dried. Yeah, this is a couple of thousand of years of old, a bit younger than that, and it's in the British Museum. Then what may be the most famous example of uh, European leather armor is uh, a rare brace. So once again, the upper armor protection from uh, that is held in British Museum. Uh, this is very elaborately made, really nice decorative toolings and, and contained traces of gesso and, and silvering. So uh, Dobson, for example, suspects that this has been originally thoroughly gilded piece or may have been. About three thick, thick millimeters thick material and there's some lining of thinner material in the, in the interior. Next kind of the bread and butter thing. We have uh, several pieces from Netherlands, excavations from there. Single layer or double layer pieces of letter armor, uh, 14th century, some warm braces, rare braces, greaves, quizzes, uh, or by alternative interpretation, body armor pieces. I believe the interpretation that they are leg armor is the more probably one. Then really neat piece. Uh, this is leather grand guard of jousting armor for uh, Maximilian the uh, first. 15th century Germany. Uh, X-rays of this particular object uh, have revealed that this leather piece contains uh, wooden pieces, several wooden pieces, and even a metallic hinge beneath the leather. So I suspect the purpose of this actual piece was to explode in a dramatic fashion when hit with the lance. So uh, kind of 
even the, the metallic hinge, so you, you get a very dramatic effect if it blows uh, and so forth. Uh, not, not perhaps uh, armor in, in that sense that it needs to last, but it, it kind of serves the purpose of exploding nicely when hit. <laughs> so kind of show, showmanship. Uh, then we have Archer Brazier. This is also in British Museum. This is described as cubely, but uh, nobody uh, probably has the idea how is it was exactly made and hardened. Then some horse armor. Uh, not much decoration. This may have been painted more elaborately originally uh, from 2500s. This is in Metropolitan Museum of Art. And maybe not the most interesting looking example, but it's a good example because it seems a recurring theme that in medieval Europe, uh, much of horse armor, uh, at least there are several surviving pieces of leather horse armor. And this is one example of those. OK. I think. Our time is running so low uh, that I don't go through this section, but we have, do have some modern material testing results from a, a few authors. Uh, much of it has been contested, and I've seen some critical, um, uh, and I've had some critical discussions about the validity of those tests. But basically, uh, they are freely accessible, um, much of it that has been published, freely accessible in the internet. I suggest you go search that out. Uh, but uh, on a general level about material testing, uh, I would like to propose a framework for that. So basically we have the, the classic two times two matrix here. Uh, what you can test for, first of all, you can make non-destructive tests. So visual inspection, x-rays, 3D scanning, uh, some stiffness and hardness testing with reservations and effects of cold heat, moisture on the factors above. And this tells us already something. Uh, of course, not as good as destructive testing, which can be uh, give more decisive results. So we can test for strength, toughness, ductility, brittleness, and effects of cold heat, moisture on the uh, factors above. Then we have lab scale testing which is good if we really don't have a, a much clue w what kind of things work and what not. So we can make s small scale samples and make laboratory style testing for the materials. This gives uh, results for relative performance of such materials, but doesn't give the absolute performance. So in order to reach that, we need full scale testing. So actual full scale constructions and samples and equipment representative of the intended use. So, for example, in lab scale test, we can push an all through to straight piece of small letter that tells us something. But if we really want to know how it performs, we need to have a armor made from it, and we shoot it with a bow or something. Yeah. Uh, there are three authors I would like to recommend in this context. First is uh, Edith Cheshire's PhD thesis, non-metallic armor prior to uh, First World War. He pretty much concluded that the historical quibbly, if we can at least interpret based on performance, uh, that it, it was actually boiled rawhide. Uh, and he has lengthy discussion about these topics. And uh, his results convincingly show that rawhide really performs a lot better than leather. But whether or not boiled rawhide, and in his terminology, boiled can mean boiled in hide glue or boiled in water. Uh, I would say it's contested that if uh, untreated rawhide performs uh, worse than boiled rawhide. But go check it out. Uh, you kind of need some engineering understanding if you want to understand the thesis. <laughs> Good luck. It's a long one. Uh, I combined a couple of figures from his uh, thesis. Uh, this is arrow penetration. So his thesis was very much based on 
making dozens of shooting trials with a very good standardized setting. He shot arrows, uh, historical arrows, through different hide based materials. And he concluded, first of all, that raw uh, hard facing is extremely effective uh, against penetrating attacks like arrows. And first of all, his conclusion was that bold draw hide performs better than uh, untreated draw hide. But just based on this picture, figure which combines data from two of his figures, I would contest that claim. So in here you can see uh, on the uh, vertical axis you see the arrow parent penetration. So if you see samples there, that's bad performance and samples on the bottom is good performance. And then uh, uh, there is areal density. So if you can add more layers of this same material, you can of course get better performance. So on the right you get very dense heavy materials, on the left you get light materials. So if you have a material on the uh, left bottom corner, that would be the optimal, and on the right top corner, that's the worst possible. So these colored samples represent leather. Uh, the dark dots represent uh, hard face boiled leather, uh, rawhide. The white ones represent uh, untreated rawhide, and, and the gray ones represent boiled rawhide. And the colored areas help to uh, identify that if they are on the same shade, they perform relatively equal. And you see that uh, untreated rawhide pretty much is in the same region than, than boiled uh, rawhide in most cases. Okay, then we have Samuel uh, James Levin's master thesis, experiments in poor belief, practical trials in medieval leathercraft. Go check that out if you are interested. And finally, uh, the, uh, unlike the two others, which were academic research, this is a lengthy blog post, but that made some circles. Uh, Jason Timmermans made some lab scale testing, and I think he established a couple of things. First of all, stearic acid is a worthy stuffing agent. It outperformed uh, other stuffing agents he had, and also other samples he had. Yeah. Sorry, stearic acid. What is it? Uh, stearine happo. So don't mix it this with stearine, which is not a good stuffing agent. So stearic acid, not stearine. Yeah. And also the idea is that you should test the, this kind of materials with heat and cold and water because they are important practical considerations which had been left completely unexplored by the academics I'm referring here. Yeah. Then I made some hardness measurements. You can read them more from the downloadable presentation. And some stiffness measurements at, uh, uh, as well. Very uh, preliminary ones, not very robust scientifically. But basically, the results are the same conclusions, for example, as with chest hire. So you have raw height, you have partially tanned leather, and you have thoroughly stuffed uh, leather with gesso and you get stiff materials. And when you're baking materials or wax hardening with beeswax and, and uh, paraffin, you'll get very non-stiff and soft materials. Yeah, I need to move on to conclusions. This is my main slide, perhaps. I, I want to propose some constructional principles. So what I see many times is that not much of it, this that I, I have touched upon today uh, is many times considered. So we have had very un one dimensional approach to leather armor, which is better wax hardened or boiled or, or, or something like that. But when you see these historical recipes, you see that they have been more constructional in their approach. So they are composite materials. They are combining several layers and so forth to balance out the modest mechanical properties of leather. So what would be actually useful is to approach is this topic more constructionally. And here I'm proposing the principles for it. So first you have the core layer of the material. This is the basis for the rest. You get high tensile strength here. You may want to increase thickness. You can do this by applying another layer of leather or partially tanned leather, rawhide. Then you may want to add lining. This may be the same thing as the strengthening layer. 
so you get no exposed flesh sites, which is important with these materials. Then you have hard facing. This should be more on the exterior side. So this prevents sharp objects from penetrating. You have some sort of base coat like gesso. So you can apply the decorative layers, paints, gilding, and so forth on top of it. And, and finally, you add, add the varnish or clear coat on top of it to protect the construction from moisture. So, okay, this may look like a complex thing, but here are the principles I would combine. If you make uh, some SCA armor or HEMA sparring armor, you don't need all these layers. You may want to have just two layers of leather, uh, laminated uh, flesh sites facing each other, wax harden it, and, and uh, you're done. And good to go. Yeah, and finally, you may w want to add some reinforcements. This is one possible placement for those. That you could have them also on the interior or in the middle to hide it, hide them if you, yeah. Okay, so what's core bully, really? I don't consider myself an expert. I'm more on the uh, technical side of things, what's possible and what's not. But uh, we have a great variety of hide-based armoring recipes. Um, I demonstrated a few of those in this presentation. And it seems also inevitable that not just one recipe existed in medieval Europe either. So we, we have probably had different recipes in different areas, what was accessible and so forth. But what we know for sure is that there's great deal of evidence about the use of partially tanned leather, animal glues, gesso, and the involvement of heat. So these are the ingredients for curably uh, most probable. And finally, once again, I really re recommend Chris Dobson's book on this topic. A few other recommendations here. So if you want to really understand where the modern uh, discussion about leather armor comes from, uh, much of it is outdated uh, and uh, good that it, it is. We have gone a great deal forward from it, but it's John Waters' leather and, uh, and the warrior that really sparked this discussion, or at least if you trace the modern discussion, you arrive into this book. Uh, this is kind of rare, expensive, but the same sentiments are there in his much older and much cheaper letter and craftsmanship. Then Dobson's ebook for uh, European met, uh, armor, and uh, some other things for for different aspects. And uh, finally, of course, if you're interested in my book, uh, I have a few last copies here uh, if, uh, available still. Okay, thank you. I'm in no hurry, and I heard that the, the <laughs> guy, guy in the back row is in no hurry either, so if you want to have a discussion, questions, uh, you're welcome. Thank you.